All right. We have been going through a series entitled Walking with God Through Suffering, and we are going to be doing that for quite some time. Uh, Pastor Paul began a few weeks ago, and this is now the third week for me teaching, kind of addressing it a little bit more from the angle of philosophy, and uh, we know that that's all of your favorite stuff. So I know you're disappointed that today is planned to be the last time for me to be teaching. Um, yes, I know. Thank you. Um, at least it is as long as we get through all this material, right? So you can gauge that when you have a question. Uh, <laughs> it's your choice. <laughs> Maybe motivation to be quiet. Um, I'm kidding. Y'all can y'all feel free to ask. This stuff isn't always super simple. Um, before I review, let's yeah, let's go ahead and pray. Lord God, we need your help. This stuff is very important. It's not always easy for someone like me to explain why it's important. Um, it's not always easy to explain it in such a way that it's understood. But some of these things are so clear. And so those things, don't let people miss. Let them take those away. Don't let them be hidden in the unclear parts of this. Um, because this is such a serious, serious topic. So would you please send your spirit to us and uh, help us to think clearly about it. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, so two weeks ago, I tried my best to introduce to you what's classically called the problem of evil and the philosophy of religion. People understand that God is all good. If he is all good, all good beings don't want evil and suffering to exist. Supposedly, God is also all-powerful and all-knowing. All-powerful and all-knowing beings can keep evil and suffering from existing. But there's evil and suffering in the world. How can that be? How can God both be not one evil and suffering, He's capable of stopping evil and suffering, but yet it exists. And it doesn't just exist in terms of scraped knees. Right? We're not just talking about minor disappointments. We have uh, my cousin's very, very close friend, which had twins. I can't remember how old she was. She was less than a year old, I believe. They were changing her diaper, felt a lump. No, that's the other child. Sorry. Anyway, they found this. This girl had cancer, gave lots of radiation. After several months, like six months of chemo and radiation, in remission. She's in remission. Little uh, Molly is in remission. Praise the Lord. Everyone's... Excited, go in for the check month, uh, checkup two or three months later, and it's all it's all over. It's all in her lungs, uh, somewhere else. I don't remember kidney or ad, abdomen or something. All right, and so what? What can we say to this? How can this be? Could could not have God stopped it? Does He not want to stop it? And what do we do with that now? Um, if you missed last week, last week was the, uh, that was the climax. Last week was the crescendo. And we did that because it was Easter. I jumped ahead and did that. If you missed that, um, well, your loss. Um, this week will be extremely anticlimactic, I feel. We are going back now and covering other ways in which this problem has been responded to and has continued to be responded to. Um, in various degrees of success. They, these all, although they are not the most important, some of them, some of them have their place. And you'll be familiar with most of them. Hopefully, I'll just be giving you kind of a category. I'll be calling it something. And you can say, oh, yeah, I've, I've thought about that a ton. We've talked about that. I know passages of scripture on that, and I'll tell you what philosophers of religion call it. Okay? Um, we also talked about uh, the two weeks ago, why the problem of evil is actually only a problem if God exists, in the sense of there is no such thing as good and evil unless there is a God. And that, was, that took us basically the whole time to talk about. Um, and then last week I gave an analogy talking about wetness and water. If you were here last, if you were here the past two weeks and you felt like that analogy helped you, would you be willing to raise your hand for me? Good. Okay, good. I'm glad that worked. I'll say it again then. <laughs> is there in the world such a thing as wetness? Does wetness 
exist. Yes, yes, well, I'm persuaded it does, right? I'm persuaded it does. Really, there's something in the world that we call wetness. It is not just some English word we invented to describe something else. that We call it wetness, but it's not really wetness. It's, it's, the wood is rotting, right? And we've just decided to call that wetness. But there's not really wetness. There's only rotting. Okay? That sounds really odd to think about. But that is ultimately what you must do if you're an atheist of talking about evil. If you do not believe there's a God and you talk about evil, there is no such thing as evil. There is things you don't like. I don't like these things. In the same way, I don't prefer uh, pickles. They're horrendous. And you, even when you take them off, they've left their infection all over <laughs> what it was. All right? <laughs> right? And that's the same as Molly's cancer. I wish it wasn't there. It's the same category. Okay? Because there is no such thing as wetness in the world unless there is something that exists that inherently of its essence is wet. Is wet. Water. Water does not get wet. Water is wet. And that only can be. There is only such a thing as dryness in the world if there is such a thing as wetness. There is only such a thing as wetness if there is something that is wet. There's only evil in the world if there's such a thing as goodness in the world. And there's only such a thing as goodness in the world is if there is something, capital S, that is good. God. God is good. It's a real thing. And I know that it's very difficult to understand because it's so obvious, right? But we can think our way into imbecility sometimes. And many people in the world have done it. So whatever you conclude from this this argument, if there were no supposed answers, you at least can't conclude that God does not exist. Hey, Joseph. Lots of analogies and draw there. Okay, that's that's a review from week one. Last week, hopefully, there will be time to get to what we covered last week and review that later. Uh, what do we talk about? Yep, yep. All right. So, first of the proposed answers. <clears throat> How do you respond to this this challenge? Some people have uh, tried to respond to why this does not prove that God does not exist by saying. Well, we've misunderstood the, the attributes of God. We don't really, God either is not really all-knowing and all-powerful, or he's not really all-good. Very, very few people want to go all-good. Um, he's not all-good. That would be something, I won't spend time to get into it right now, like Eastern religions. The reason why the problem of evil does not disprove the existence of God, according to a Buddhist and most Hindus and Sikhs, is because God is beyond goodness and evil. Goodness, goodness and evil are not attributes of him because he's not a him. God is impersonal, ultimately. And it's very difficult for most of us Westerners to think that way. There is a lot of insight in terms of the, the clarity of contrast by studying those religions. And if you're interested, we can talk more about it later. We talked some about Buddhism the first week. Probably more relevantly to us today, is that God is limited in knowledge and power in some way. This is a proposition. God is all good. He doesn't want evil and suffering to exist, but he is, to some degree, incapable of preventing it. The most classic version of this is called open theism. It's called open theism because belief in that God is in time with us. The timelessness of God is, uh, is nonsense. To exist outside of time is nonsense, they would say. Um, and because of that, the he, God can have extremely good predictive power of the future, but nonetheless not certain, not sure. The future is open. It's open. This is extremely, extremely popular today, both explicitly in this term, open theism, and implicitly. They'll appeal to scriptures like um, when Abraham takes Isaac, I'm 
on the mountain, right? Holds up the, the blade to offer the sacrifice of his son. And what's God say? Stop. No, don't do that. Abraham, now I know. Now I know that you will follow me. Right? And they feel the scriptures like that. And it's a very poor interpretation, a very poor hermeneutic to conclude that then God does not know the future. The Bible speaks in very human terms. We say anthropomorphically in human terms all the time, talking about the mighty right arm of God. In fact, in the same uh, the passage right next to that, when God's talking about Sodom and Gomorrah, remember he says, let me go down to see whether or not they've been as wicked as I think they have been. So now God's not only not omniscient, he's not omnipresent. And of course, not even the open theist wants to read that passage that way. It's a very poor hermeneutic to read the Bible that way. Now, the reason people like this so much, they like... Oh, you can't... Can you see that? All right. Because they, they like the idea of God not knowing the future because it supposedly disconnects him from historical events that are evil and suffering exists. We say some historical event happens and both humans... And God, and God are behind that thing occurring. Not in the same way, hence the different arrows, right? <clears throat> it's not the same way, but in some ways they're behind it, and they want to completely uh, X out this one. If this event is evil, they want to just destroy this arrow. God was not behind it in any way. We have free will, and we choose to do something horrendous that God wished we hadn't have done. But he's a respecter of persons or something like that. And so this, they're trying their best to get rid of that arrow. So that's supposedly the benefit. Supposedly. There are multiple problems with this. Firstly, the problem is, uh, I have that, if this is true, then Christianity is not true. The Bible says that God knows the future. Isaiah 45, 7, no, no, 46, 5 through 8. Um, most importantly, here, this, Jesus at the Last Supper, he's telling his disciples um, that Judas is going to betray him. And then he, t he tells them, I'm telling you this now before it takes place, so that when it does take place, you may believe that ego eimi, that I am, the Greek equivalent of the Hebrew Yahweh. We know that's what he claimed. He claimed that a few chapters earlier, and then the Jews tried to kill him because he claimed, I am. And here Jesus says, I'm telling you these things now before they take place, so that when they do take place, you'll know that I'm God. You'll know that I'm divine. And Jesus stakes his divinity on his knowledge of the future. So if God doesn't know the future, then Christianity is not true. Even more so, this seems to be so obvious to me. If you try in some way to just get rid of this arrow altogether, God is in no way behind evil, in no sense, no level whatsoever. Is he behind evil and suffering in the world? Then he's not behind anything that happens. He's not only not behind that evil and suffering, he's not, he's not behind that good in your life either. And in fact, now that evil and suffering is in your life, he can't really help you. He's hands off. He becomes, remember last week we talked about multiple things that cross helps us with. The very first thing is he's a co-sufferer. He empathizes with us. That's all you get in open theism. He is the big empathizer. He can cry with you. He can feel bad for you. He can wish it weren't that way. And that's all you get. He cannot help you. I want to take time here. This is, this is surprisingly common. This is surprisingly common. There are ministries that you know of where the leadership adheres to this largely. Um, and I don't know too many details, so I'm reluctant to name them explicitly. This is more common than you would expect. Okay? God does not know the future. Now, let's move on to more beneficial propositions. Right? Soul making. This is what philosophers say. This is one reason why God allows evil and suffering in the world. They say, what this says is that God made this world and it is perfect. It's perfect for what it was designed to be. Which is not so much uh, you know, Candyland, it's a, it's a training ground. 
that this world is boot camp. That's probably the most shallow way to put it. The idea that this world is hard because it develops evil and suffering in our lives. Uh, it develops uh, character. Um, there is a kind of truth to this. Uh, the Bible emphasizes, New Testament just hammers this, that suffering in our lives, though it is hard, though it is difficult, ultimately it produces in us character. Right? Uh, uh, there's some passage there, Romans 5, right at the beginning, it says that we rejoice in our sufferings because suffering produces patience. Patience produces proven character. Proving character produces hope. The love of God has been poured out into our lives through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. So there's a connection made over and over again between suffering and character. And go even further with this. Um, in fact, and it's harder to explain, except for we had last week already, that suffering in our lives also keeps, it, it helps us live life more awake, more aware. That contrast, that, that every man here who's been shopping for that engagement ring goes to go purchase a diamond and the diamond is put not just out in front of you, they get out a piece of black velvet and put it on top of it. And it does not increase the diamond's brilliance, but it helps reveal it. And we talked a lot about that last week, both in terms of what is love and justice and goodness if the, the parallels are, do not exist. So how we come to experience life and know it, being in this story of conflict where there are villains and where there are heroes, we're more awake. And even the last thing we said, soul making, we are made into someone who can receive that revelation as we begin to identify with this Christ who was made perfect through suffering, this Christ who endured the worst evil world for us. We can, re we can receive that more fully. So there is something that is helpful here and biblical in this response. Uh, this is an extremely personal issue. Christians are really quick to pull this one out. Well, suffering is used for good. You shouldn't be so upset. All right. Oh, yeah, well, easy. Easy. Okay. I'm very reluctant. Being someone whose life has been such a cakewalk, I'm very reluctant to, to appeal to this. You have a testimony, and you can identify, I have suffered, and I have seen at least some of the things God has done with that in my life in helping me. Uh, be a more godly person and to know him better, um, then this would be a good, a good place to go. This does not cover things like hell, right? This ha is hell, um, it, hell will come up in almost all of them. As we talked about the problem of evil and suffering. Because is, is hell making these people more Christ-like? Right? That doesn't seem to be the purpose of hell. Um, it's not the purification process that the Bible talks about does not apply to non-Christians. Okay, so that's cons with it. Y'all cool with that one? I'll we'll come back to y'all. Quote by Malcolm Mugridge. I found this very helpful. He says, contrary to what might be expected, I look back on experiences that at the time seemed especially desolating and painful with particular satisfaction. Indeed, I can say with complete truthfulness that everything I have learned in my 75 years in this world, everything that has truly enhanced and enlightened my existence, has been through affliction and not through happiness, whether pursued or attained. In other words, if it ever were to be possible to eliminate affliction from our earthly existence by means of some drug or other medical mumbo-jumbo, the result would not be to make life delectable, but to make it too banal or trivial to be endurable. This, of course, is what the cross signifies. And it is the cross more than anything else that has called me inexorably to Christ. Excellent quote. I can't say that, having been someone who's endured so little. Uh, skip that one. Uh, this one is very new-ish in philosophical literature. Uh, if you care about it, you can ask me later. Um, the most common response in Christian circles is the idea of free will. God has permitted evil and suffering to exist because he wanted free will to exist. And you can make this kind of upset a soft claim and a strong claim. Basically, the idea is humans are factors in historical events that come to pass. Right? That's, that's fair. 
stronger claim is something like this, that God wants more than anything else in creation. He wants the possibility of genuine, loving relationships. You cannot coerce those, so the, uh, you must have this thing called free will, but to have free will is to run the risk of it being used for bad rather than good. He wants loving relationships. Loving relationships require free will. Free will is a risky business. Uh, the pros of this is that something like free will exists, right? That's a very difficult idea to nail down. Like, where is my free will? Can I touch it? What, what is that? Uh, I've defined it this way. The Bible depicts humans. We are morally responsible decision makers whose decisions significantly impact historical events. If that's what you mean by free will, then amen, we have free will. All right, and it depends on the day and who I'm talking to. When someone asks me, do you believe in free will, whether I say yes or no, right? I, I get, I don't know, it just depends on how I'm feeling. <laughs> it depends on what I choose to do. <laughs> and this is important, right? Because, sure, I put that little diagram again. Because that top arrow exists. And when something's evil in the world, someone's got to pay. There must be moral responsibility placed somewhere. So if it's not going to be with God, it's got to be with us, us or Satan. People throw Satan in here, but I'm trying to, I've got a far, far more complicated version of this for diagram critiquers. Okay, and we can talk about it later. Um, uh, so that, so that's that's helpful. We, when you think of the evil and suffering in the world. What do you think of first? Eventually, you'll get to tsunamis. But first, you're thinking of holocausts. Right? You're thinking of people going in schools with knives. That's what you're thinking of. So that's, that's helpful. Someone's got to blame. take the blame. If it's not God, it's us. The cons of it is free will is a kind of more vague concept than you realize. It's thrown around very quickly. Um, it does not touch natural disasters very well at all. People want to try to throw Satan in there. But the reality is people have not, they do not have a good idea about the scripture teaches about God's sovereignty. Book of Job. Who takes away Job's kids? Who brings the disasters? Satan. We know that. We read the story. Did Job know that? Job didn't know that. In the end of Job, chapter, oh man, he says it twice. I can't remember if he says it into one or the end of two. He says, the Lord gave and the Lord take a, took away in all these things. Here's the divine commentary. In all these things, Job did not sin nor charge God with wrongdoing. The Lord gave. The Lord took away. He didn't charge God with wrongdoing. So, so there are, there's a far more complicated diagram we could draw in the way God is over what we and angels do. Um, though he is not morally culpable for them. But this is important, because we want to call people. People want to always talk about, why does God allow this evil in the world? Why does God allow us this evil? And we should come back and sometimes pretty strongly and say, it's a really good question. Why does he allow you to continue to exist? Why doesn't he crush you this moment for the evil you bring in this world? It's a great question. I agree. So this is an important point. It can't do with a strong claim cannot bear the weight people put on it. They, free will solves the problem. No, it doesn't. As soon as you try to make it, you run into open theism. The only way to make free will bear all the way the problem of evil is to go the open theist route. And God, that arrow, that second arrow, has to be erased entirely. I, I didn't have it lighter to make it uh, seem like it's less significant. I make it lighter to go, it's not clear how God is behind everything. He is, but it's not easy to put your finger on. It's not the same way we are. Pressing on to, this is the last one. Oh, this is good. Y'all can interrupt. We got, we got so much time left. This is the last one. Skeptical theism. And you know this one. You don't know it by that term. And sorry, I put that word on there. God, the way God knows things is so much more vast than the way we know things. He knows so much more than we do. As high as the heavens are above the earth, so are my ways above your ways and my knowledge above your knowledge. 
the secret things belong to the Lord our God, but the revealed things belong to us and our children forever. This is the point of Job. Job, at the end of Job, chapter 38, for three chapters, there's like over 300 questions that God asked Job. Job's kind of going, this isn't fair. Why? There's no good reason for this evil to exist in my life. I've been righteous. And God comes back and says, oh, that's right. That's right. I forgot. You know, you, you, you know everything that's going on. That's right. So while, while we're talking about these things, why don't you go ahead and tell me, where, where did the universe come from again? And where are the storehouses where I get all that hail and snow? How does that animal exist? Right. And he just question, question, question. We don't know. Right? And you take your dog to the vet to get vaccines, the dog does not like it, and they are not happy. But you have morally justified reasons for allowing the dog to get the shots. And there's not a problem with you in, in you know, you're keeping it secret from them. You're not going to tell your dog the reasons. No, there is a gap in the ability of knowledge and understanding between you and the dog. You, how are you going to communicate to the dog, I have morally justifiable reasons? What's he going to say back? This is extremely biblical, right? And this is very inherent to the concept of faith. I think y'all have heard me teach on what is faith a lot. We, we know, th- we're certain, absolutely certain of th- some things. It doesn't mean I understand it exhaustively. The modern culture equates certainty with full understanding. You don't know it perfectly, you can't be certain, so you should doubt everything. Who says? Are you certain of that? Are you certain that I shouldn't be certain unless I understand it completely? No, right? I'm certain. How? Because God told me. That's why I'm certain. I don't understand everything about it. And that's where we stand here. Now, the, the weakness of this, like all of them, is this can't stand by itself. Right. All right. So this this horrific event occurs. Supposedly, God could have morally justifiable reasons for its occurring. Supposedly, He could. He could have those, and I not know them. Does He? Does He? How do we know? Good Friday and Easter. That's how we know. Skeptical theism, we often just play that card, and we, we know in our heart of hearts, you all were sitting there going, yeah, of course he has good reasons, right? Most of you were sitting there thinking that, and the reason is, is because you already have the cross and the resurrection in mind. And lots of people are communicating to, we've got to, we have to connect the dots for them. They don't have these things in mind. And we want to claim saying, well, God... God does lots of things. It's mysterious. Well, he's mysterious. Yeah, he is. But if that's all you say, well, they're left hanging. How do I know? Because of Calvary. Because of Calvary, we know. Because he took this evil and suffering that no one got. He told them. Claire and I were just looking at it this morning, right? And Luke, he's saying, uh, You're the Messiah. Jesus, and then Jesus says, hey, don't go tell anyone, because I've got to first, I've got to die, and in three days to be raised from the dead. And Peter's going, no, no, you won't, never, you won't do this. And he said it three times, and Luke says it again and again, and he told him again about his death and resurrection, and he told him again he's going to resurrect, and then it happens, and they all flee and run, they don't get it, they don't connect the dots, but yet, in time, revealed this was the greatest thing that ever could have happened. God is in control. God's working good through it. Yes, it's evil. He is not morally culpable for it. That's Acts 2 and 4. Let's even look at that. We've got time. That's worth it. This is, we're going back to the last week now. Let's look at, let's go to chapter 4. Verse 27. How do we know? Supposedly God has good reasons for this. And supposedly, he's not morally culpable 
for it. Humans are. How do you know? Verse 27, Acts chapter 4. For truly in this city there were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod, Pontius Pilate, Gentiles, people of Israel, humans, to do whatever your hand and your plan had predestined to take place. See that? We call that compatibilist free will. There are humans who are behind the historical event. They are morally responsible for the evil they did. But what they meant for evil, God meant for good. That's another quote. And this, the death, the murder of the perfect, blameless Son of God is the greatest thing that's ever happened. So, top-down thinking, right? Top-down thinking. If God could do it with the greatest evil and He could work the greatest good out of it, then what about cancer? I don't see how. I didn't, they didn't see how then either. I don't see how I can do it. I don't connect the dots. Maybe in glory. Maybe we'll get to know. I suspect eventually. We'll find out. But I can rest assured that he does have good reasons. He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not with him freely give us all things? So we combined. Uh, this is the first place I go. If I got a long time with someone, I talk about our evil. All this problem of evil. What about our evil? Why doesn't God squash us? Right? And you say, well, my evil's not that big of a deal. Oh, is it not? So he doesn't, he doesn't really have time to care about the things you do? Is that right? That cuts both ways. Right? If he's not concerned about the evil you commit and holding you accountable for it, then he shouldn't be too concerned about the cancer that comes your way either. Right? That cuts both ways. It is a big deal. And God has a flawless track record. Absolutely flawless. That he can work good out of that. And he does care for me despite this. And even though I don't understand, he understands. And I depend on that. I depend on that character that's been proven. Okay. So let's, let's take... I want to be able to clarify... Hey, we got 10 more minutes. I, I'm happy to keep going and keep giving details, but I'd like to maybe hone in on anything. If you have questions, you didn't understand something, or you feel like something got left out, anything like that. Hey. That's great. That's great. So did you all hear that, Miss Diane said? <clears throat> that doesn't mean that God guarantee him guaranteeing that he's working good in something that's hard doesn't mean he's going to end that hard thing, that suffering or that evil. And I would want to add right now, right now, amen. God does not make that promise. Do not be surprised at fire trials when they come your way as if something strange were happening to you, First Peter. So there's twofold. One is that promise. Uh, we have let's Point uh, B is promised in the same way that the evil and the suffering that was committed to the Son of God on Calvary was unwound and undone three days later in the resurrection, so will that cancer eventually be unwound. Not necessarily in three days. That promise is not made. But we do have that just like You think of Joseph, is it 11 years, 13 years in prison, doing the right thing, people tricking him, people, I can only think of inappropriate language, uh, doing him wrong and thinking, okay, any day now, Lord, any day now. And if he, could, if he prolongs it 13 years, then maybe it'll be 30. That's right. Um, but it doesn't mean that while those things are happening, God has good in them. That's the, the point. 
They meant it for evil. Your brothers meant it for evil when they sold you into slavery. And they are responsible for it, and they know it, based on them trying to uh, cover up for it. You can see, read that in Genesis chapter 50. But God uses it to bring about the, uh, the salvation, the, the earthly salvation of a whole people, saving them from famine. So there is good worked out in it, in itself, um, even though it's extremely hard and may not end until glory. That's good clarification, Ms. Diane. Thank you. That's really helpful. One other thing, one thing Claire and I had to learn a lot as we, we tried to plan for the future and, and as we continue to discern God's calling, because some things seem so hard and so unbearable, and you feel like at the moment going, wow, I just, could, we couldn't do it. Like, God doesn't seem to have it in me to be able to bear that. And she got great counsel from someone in this church. Ran to buy, I mean, never mind, no one in the church none of y'all, that said, look, it's you, not the normal practice of God to give you the grace for the thing that you're not in, right? You're, pl- you're imagining yourself in some really difficult situation and expecting to think about it really happily, but you're not there. God, the grace is sufficient for today, right? Tomorrow's worries are, su- are uh, he said it the other way around, today's troubles are sufficient for themselves, so that grace that God will get us through it, but, but don't think that, okay, if I get cancer one day or if I'm called to the Middle East or to, to give up these things, lay it down that I possess and move to the inner city or any of those things, I couldn't do that. That's saying too hard. He's got grace for that, and he'll give it to you when you need it. There's a wonderful story. I don't know enough about it to maybe make it as good as it could be. That Ravi Zacharias talks about 
uh, the, the dresses that the Indian women wear on their wedding days. What are these called? Yeah, saris. But uh, it's always a, they're handmade. All of them are handmade on the big, oh gosh, I don't know any of the terms, right? The big thing with the bow or the sled. But loom, right? The sled? Matt? They call it things. It's a little far. They have to, and they, they're weaving. He's got, and the, the dad, is, it's almost always a dad-son combo in these, these businesses. And, and the, the, the dad is up there. He's weaving. He's got this vision in mind of what it is he's weaving together. He's got the end in mind. Right, and he's doing it, okay? And the son is underneath. He's underneath the weave, and all he does is pass the, the loom back to his father, and it's, there's all these little strings hanging down that have to get cleaned up later. It just, it, does, it looks chaos from this perspective. Now, he doesn't only see the gradual process. He's, he's not aware of the gradual process that's being developed. He's not, even, he's not aware of the end goal, of what the end thing's going to look like, and we will spend all of eternity getting to get back on the other side and, and getting to see, oh, wow, over here. Oh, when you handed me it over here, this is what you were, oh, oh, wow. It's an eternity seeing that. So it's excellent. Hey, Tyler. Yeah, he's passing it back up in some way or the other. Mm-hmm. That's good. Does the sun have any influence in the weaving? Is that how you worded it? The weaving of the sorry. Yeah. Humans are significant decision makers who are morally responsible and, ma- and influence the way history unfolds. All right, guys. Well, we'll, I mean, each one of these, if you feel like, man, water hose didn't catch a lot of that, we're, we're going to keep going. We're going to recycle back to every one of these over the next several weeks. You'll hear almost all of this again and again because we don't learn after one time. It takes several times, and we'll come in and try to. I don't know what all Pastor Paul's going to do. That's, that's his job, to, to connect more dots, make it more practical, more pastoral, more examples of where these various things will connect in our lives. But the summary there is this supposed argument that disproves the existence of God is only true if God exists and if he doesn't have morally sufficient reasons. Okay, He's got morally sufficient reasons, and we know that because of Calvary at least. Okay? So, if you have any questions, we can talk over lunch. You don't come and grab me. Pray with me, please. Lord God, we are so glad that you've given us rock-solid assurance that you hold all things in your hand. And just like the atonement, you are over all the glorious aspects and you are in no way uh, morally at blame for the bad things that happen in this world. You only are just. You are only good. And you only do what is just and good. We admit our ignorance. We don't see how that can be so often. Um, But if you can do it in the biggest thing, the biggest event in history, the most atrocious thing in history, then you can do it in these things as well. God, that doesn't make it easy. And you know that. You lived our lives. So in the way your son drew help from you, Uh, We pray that all of us would do the same, and we would draw help from you to endure suffering in the face um, and, and not take it lightly, and we would not give shallow counsel to others. Lord, may we empathize and may we be sensitive of when to say what and how, and we want to be used by you to bring some of that grace to others. So we trust you. We love you. And we thank you for Jesus and his embrace of the cross. And we pray in his name. Amen.